So what are we looking at here? Why is this big tree down? Was it dangerous? And what danger did it represent? I think this is just payback. Uh, or jobs for the boys. There's no reason why this should have been cut down. It's this giant, big, beautiful tree that's been sitting here for maybe three, four hundred years. And now the department deemed that it's dangerous and needed to be cut down. It's not even on a road that is used. It's not a logging road. It's not a tourist road. So these were the trees your court case was defending yes. largely. Yes. They've all been cut down. Retribution. That's all it is. It's just absolute senseless destruction of giant big old trees. You've become quite famous uh, over that remarkable case you conducted successfully against Vic Forest um, and their persistent logging of Brown Mountain. Have I got it right? Um, oh, persistent logging of areas that shouldn't be logged because they have threatened species. In Brown them. Mountain or elsewhere? Brown Mountain was yeah. the test case. They've done it for years in every forest, but yeah. You succeeded in that case, amazingly, um, and then what's happened subsequently? Have the laws changed? Um, you had another case happening, didn't you, or someone else was bringing it? We've, had, it? Um, we've done three legal challenges, um, and we've won all three. But the Brown Mountain case was the biggest, and yes, that was a great test case. Um, we kicked a lot of goals, and we set a lot of precedents for other groups to take legal action. So what's happened is that we proved that Vic Forests were not abiding by government's own rules. Um, they had to do pre-logging surveys before they go in and log areas that might have threatened species in them. Um, and they weren't doing those at all? They weren't doing that at all. If they couldn't find them, that's better. They didn't want to know about them. Pretty remarkable arrogance, isn't oh, it? Oh, God, yes. Oh, even where we were finding them, they were going, oh, God. So they've changed the law for potteroos. Where we used to find the long-footed potteroo, which was an endangered, very small, little, like a mini kangaroo, mm. um, they'd have to protect 450 hectares. And then they changed the law, so now they only have to protect 50, and it doesn't have to be the detection site. So if we find one right in the middle of a planned forest to be logged, they can protect 50 hectares somewhere over the other side of the gully. So who changed that law? Was it Brumby? It was no, it was um, it was um, the Liberal government. So you actually um, started the case under Brumby, didn't you, or was it, it Brax? 2009. Brumby, and then uh, the Liberal government came Brax, in. I think it was. All oh, right. Okay. Anyway. Uh, and then the Liberal go government came in and carried on the bad work of the Labor Party. Oh yes. yes. In fact, they're just the same, aren't and they? And so they wanted to mm. change the Code of Forest Practices, which the law comes under. It's a it's it's a mess of laws that mm -hmm. all sort of interconnect and, and management mm -hmm. plans and codes. Mm -hmm. But the code did say that um, they have to abide by the management plan and the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act. And so what the government was going to do then was change the code or the wording in it in the, or the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act so that a minister could just say, no, where you find threatened species, you don't have to protect them, go in and log. So they're going to change the whole thing just by adding one extra sentence in. I don't know if they have yet, I don't think they have, mm -hmm. because they realised that it would open up more legal cases. Um, Against them for what To reason? challenge that change. Because On what basis? Well, uh, again, all the laws are interconnected, so if they change that one, yes. then it's not abiding by by what this law states okay. it must do, etc., etc. And it goes back to the RFAs and uh, all sorts of things. Uh, um, so at the moment, they are carrying out pre logging surveys, but we call them Mickey Mouse surveys because they're so. They're so poorly done, mm -hmm. they've got such limited funds to give the experts to go and look for these things. And they look for them, you know, they might look for owls in the middle of summer. Well, that's not when you look for owls, you know, no. in winter when they're calling During the daylight, eh? Yeah, that sort of thing. So the poor um, surveyors that are given the task of doing the pre-logging surveys, just, you know, they might find a tenth of what's there because they just don't have the time and resources to spend. So that suits Vic Forest very well. That's how they're getting away with it now, um, logging a lot of areas that have threatened species, but they just don't look for them properly now. How did you go financially? What sort of 
toll did it take on you? Oh, huge. It was huge. We had saved up $40,000, which was a lot for a small regional environment group over the years. Um, and we thought they're going in there, they were going in there with the bulldozers. We thought we've got to stop them, they are in the wrong, they are breaking the law, you know, it's the English language. Um, so we just had to say, go for it lawyers, you know, I don't know where we're going to get the money for, but, from. But um, anyway, once we started the case, there was such huge public support that donations just... How did you out. manage that public support, you reckon? Oh, well, we put it out there on social media, we let our members know. We've got about 300 members, but I think it just went viral, you know. Though. We just put it out everywhere, and other environment groups, and people just thought, yes, you know, somebody needs to sue the government. For, for destruction of our old other environment life. groups were really impressed um i guess also the fact that something like 70 or 75 percent of the people even in this region in east gippsland want to retain the forests mm, and they're very right. rarely given um a platform yes. to show their will yes yes that's right so we, we were doing fun we weren't doing much more than just fundraising that whole time for two years um, and people were very generous, you know, pensioners sending in $15 and other people sending in a thousand or five thousand, you know, they were just incredible lot of, I was just constantly writing tax receipts and sending off thank yous. So it was, it was huge public support and it just shows you, you know. So subsequent to that, um, is the heat off or is it just slowly building up again? Is it continuous? No, so? nothing has really changed, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, a few areas have been protected and uh, it seems to be where they didn't really want to log anyway. But um, what they're doing now, we found them out, we found them <laughs> logging protected rainforest sites of significance. So we um, threatened suing with that again and they caved in before we got to the court steps. Um, so the governments are really adamant, uh, Liberal and Labor, to protect the loggers at all costs, even though they're not making any money for the people. Huge liability, this logging industry. This, this, well, it's a, it's a government-owned logging monopoly now, Vic Forests. Huge liability. It's cost the government millions to, um, to defend it in court. We've got to find out what they're getting out of it. It's not just money. It's also oh. land management. It's opening up land and so on, I think. Uh, yeah, it's a land grab. It's, it's the real estate they want. It's not the old growth forest. They've not got very good timber in it because, you know, they're old and twisted and dark. And... Okay, but they've got some superb hardwoods, haven't they? A hardwood but, is like No, in metal. old growth, not so much. But no. what, where old growth grows and where these nice, rich, lush, wildlife-rich valuable forest grow is on the highest productivity land flat yes. topography yes. deep soil high yes. rainfall perfect for plantations hey and it's public land public money clear the forest put in these nice single tree, single species tree farms sucker public has to pay for it that's what's been happening for 40 years so you... now where we used to have this landscape of beautiful old growth diverse forest you know the the threatened tiger quoll, the owls, all these wonderful creatures here. It's now, and that and that was sort of like these little pockets of logging. Now it's these little pockets of old growth in this sea of damned, you know, tree farms for the overseas pulp industry. Tell us about the wildlife you see. You you got a you got a short film of a potteroo. Um, gathering uh, brushes in his tail, actually, didn't oh, you? That was the first. That was amazing, yes. We used a lot of um, infrared cameras, night, night um, cameras that were triggered by movement or infrared or um, heat. So that, that actually got the first picture of a, of a potteroo actually gathering brush for its little um, nests. And it would just dig it and tuck it under its legs and in, in, in its tail and hop off with it. And like that was like, whoa. Like a bird making a nest. Yeah, amazing. So we've got all of these. Like we don't know half of what we've got here and what they do. It's still such an unknown area, East Gippsland. And the, the number of threatened species we have here, both plant and animals, is seven times the state average. So it, it, it is a Noah's Ark, you know, and it should be protected for that. And the more we protect this area, we've, you know, it's seven times more important for threatened species in Victoria than anywhere else. So it's, it's just phenomenal. The birds that we have, um, the insects that we still don't know exist that play a really important part in pollination, um, you know, all the little mammals, 
the reptiles, the bats. It, it's just extraordinary the amount of wildlife we have here. And I think if we could, or we could, we do, if the government could realise the value in this. And a lot of the, um, the tourism now is, is sort of, uh, ecotourism is the part of the tourism industry that's just growing phenomenally. People want to come out here, they want to experience but the nature. The government as seems it to want be. to discourage it. They want to see the wildlife. Yes. And that's where these the money that's going now to prop up this damn destructive industry that, you know, if it was a person that would be a, be a welfare bludger um, and a vandal, and they're just giving millions to this industry to destroy these areas that could be just, you know, the, the showcase of Australia. It could be globally important to bring in these visitors and, and take them on night walks and show them the gliders and stand at the base of this massive big tree that's 15 metres around and like know. seeing a, a, a real live dinosaur to yes, see a creature that that's big right. yes in and a that's tree. what we should be valuing but they're just cutting them down every day and they're just destroying them uh, I'm interested to know how um, this area has been able to attract so many excellent tree sitters and such uh, <laughs> dynamic uh, participation uh, I, I very much doubt whether you would have gone as far as you had with uh, against Vic Forests without so many people somehow invested uh, emotionally in the area and appreciating its trees. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Oh well, the the, the actual protesters are like um, a little group that's run by Gecko, another another group that that, that organises the protesting. Um, but as well as protesters, we've we've as you say, I've got a lot of people that have sort of. In invested interest in this area just because they love East Gippsland, they remember it from their holidays or they love the forests up here, they've been here and they know what's what's at stake. So yeah, we there is a, a very wide supporter base out there in Victoria and Australia.